Classroom Under the Sea is made possible through the generous support of Diversity in Aquatics, the project's official sponsor. To learn more, please visit diversityinaquatics.com. Additional support for this episode comes from Jules Undersea Lodge. With more information online at jul.com. Classroom Under the Sea is presented by the Marine Resources Development Foundation on Key Largo in the Florida Keys and Roan State Community College, one of Tennessee's community colleges. Cool. Is that cool? All right. ah, good. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> Corey and Timmy will be joining us for Classroom Under the Sea right after this. Welcome to Classroom Under the Sea. I'm Jessica Fain from Rome State Community College and we're broadcasting live from Jules Undersea Lodge in Key Largo, Florida. If you hear any background noise, that's just our live support systems. If you have any questions or comments during today's program, please feel free to post them to the Classroom Under the Sea Facebook page or our Twitter account using hashtag Classroom Under the Sea. Today we're going to be talking about sunken ships and buried treasure, or better known as underwater archaeology. Here joining me today we have Mr. Corey Malcolm, who is the Director of Archaeology at the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum, and we have Dr. Tam Timmy Gambin. Um, Timmy Gambin is the senior lecturer at the Malta University. All right, how are you guys doing today? Good, thanks. Well, we're glad that you guys are here. Yeah. So Corey, I think we're going to start with you. We're going to talk a little bit about the archaeology. You've got some great stories of pirate <laughs> ships and slave ships. Um, tell us a little bit about archaeology, why it's important, and how you got involved. Well, um, yeah, let me, I guess, give a little bit of background who I am. Uh, uh, I'm the director of archaeology for the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum in Key West, Florida. Uh, we were founded in, um, back in 1982 by Mr. Mel Fisher, who was uh, a man considered to be the world's greatest treasure hunter and was a, a, a famous underwater explorer, especially down here in the, in the Florida Keys. Uh, uh, our group uh, uh, is a, a research center, we're a not-for-profit organization, and we are a, a research center dedicated to uh, exploring the uh, maritime heritage, uh, researching it, and uh, sharing it via various veg educational vehicles, uh, primarily a museum that we operate. Uh, but uh, uh, we are focused on the maritime heritage here in the Florida Keys uh, and, and the Bahamas. And so uh, we work on shipwrecks, uh, different aspects of maritime heritage, um, and believe me, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, aspect uh, of this area. Uh, we have literally the, uh, the history of the New World uh, from 500 years ago on up to last week. Somebody probably wrecked a ship. Uh, and uh, you know, it's all there underwater uh, to be explored, to be uh, uh, figured out, and, and to help, help us understand our world a little bit better. Right. So when you go, I guess, to find a, sh a site or a shipwreck, um, can you tell us a little bit about that process? How do you find the shipwreck? What what goes on? Oh my gosh! You know that can things? happen in in uh, many different ways. Uh, um, sometimes it can be very purposeful. You know, you you uh, and and this has happened where we're going through an old document or a newspaper or something, and you say, "Oh my gosh! Look, there's a story of a shipwreck. I wonder where that happened." And and so you go and you try to pinpoint it, and you do all sorts of. Uh, uh, specialized surveys uh, um, and and try to locate the shipwreck site, um, or it can happen the other way where uh, a shipwreck is sort of stumbled upon, and then it becomes a case of okay, what is it? <laughs> and so it requires sort of the reverse uh, set of uh, techniques. So um, it can happen uh, in different ways, and and we've we've experienced all of that. Um, so, uh, uh, but uh, you know, surveying it in and of itself, there are various techniques that we use, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that throughout the program. Uh, you know, so, uh, uh, sometimes we use a magnetometer, which measures the Earth's magnetic field. Sometimes we use, sometimes uh, we use our eyeballs, and uh, uh, you know, you you uh, simply get out there and, and and try to figure out what's what, you know, via those techniques. So. You guys um, have done a lot of 
research on a lot of different wrecks. The mm -hmm. Mel Fisher Museum has, they've done the Atocha, they've done the Guerrera. Do, would you like to speak a little bit about the Guerrera? Especially? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, you know, the, the Florida Keys has a, 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 a wonderful uh, variety of shipwrecks from, like I say, all time periods. Uh, uh, of course, our museum is famous for having a very large collection from the 1622 galleons that uh, our founder, Mel Fisher, found, uh, the galleons of Tocha and Santa Margarita. Wonderful, uh, you know, Spanish galleons filled with New World treasures, and, and uh, that is a big aspect of Florida Keys history. We have multiple Spanish fleets that have wrecked up and down the Florida Keys. Um, uh, another aspect that we study a lot here is the slave trade. Not that the Florida Keys was a big slave trading center, um, but the Caribbean Basin was. And so we have a lot of ships that were sailing either through the Gulf Stream to get back to Europe or going to Cuba, where there were a lot of uh, 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 slaves being bought and sold in Cuba. Uh, and uh, one of those ships uh, was a ship called the Guerrero, and it wrecked in 1827. It was sail had sailed from Havana um, was literally a pirate ship. It would go out into the Atlantic, um, plunder ships as it came upon them, you know, uh, hold cutlasses to people's throats and steal their, everything but their clothes. Literally, we have accounts of that. Somehow the Guerrero uh, wound up in 1827, have, went all the way to the area of Liberia and uh, captured or somehow acquired uh, over 500 people, almost 600 African people was bringing them back to sell them in Cuba uh, when it was spied by a British Navy ship um, off the Bahamas. The British Navy ship was there to stop slave ships because the slave trade was illegal in 1827. Uh, the, uh, uh, they got into a chase, they got into a gun battle, um, they kind of lost track of where they were because night fell and both of the ships slammed headlong into the reef right here, very near where we are now, uh, and off Key Largo. And uh, uh, so uh, it's a fascinating tale. It's a really interesting look into an aspect of history that we're really not taught all that much about, the slave trade. And uh, we've spent many years going through the old documents and the historical record and trying to figure out where exactly this all happened and uh, we've worked with many different partners um, to, to, to uh, try to locate this site and, and I think you know after a few years of research and surveying that we have found the site. So what happens next? We don't know. We're spending a lot of time now just mapping things, looking at the different things underwater to see is it really what we think it is and, and uh, you know if we can uh, uh, absolutely prove it then who knows what the next level will be. Um, can you explain a little bit about this mapping process? And Timmy, you're more than welcome to jump in on this one because I know you've got lots of experience with this too. Um, but what all goes into mapping a shipwreck? Well, you know, for us, and 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 uh, again, this is a, that's always a different thing, you know, because every shipwreck is its own story and its own environment, and it has its own needs. And so, on a ship like uh, uh, what we're looking at, or I'm talking about now. Uh, it's in very shallow water. We're in 8 to 12 feet of water. Um, and so it's really a matter of laying a baseline down and simply taking measurements and, and, and drawing in and, and writing a map by hand and, and uh, um, documenting it that way. Lots of photographs, lots of videotape, uh, uh, but uh, that's really what it comes to. It's just hands-on taking measuring tapes and mapping things out. I believe you were using some uh, new technology to record. To yeah, record yeah, and, and this is uh, an, another, yeah, definitely, you know, the, the, the future is here now. And so we're doing some 3D uh, mapping and, and getting into that. I've spent uh, uh, the past year really working towards that. And uh, um, I've used a little on the Guerrero site, actually. Um, but it, it's, it's uh, uh, a technique where... It's called 3D photogrammetry. And so you have a normal photograph, and I, I see on the screen that they, you have some, these are concrete barrels from a shipwreck not too far here off, off Key Largo. Um, these were cement, uh, uh, a ship from around 1900. It was carrying barrels of cement. And so now on the seafloor, the barrels have rotted away. It's left the cement has hardened and left the form of the barrel. Um, so you can see the standard 2D photograph, but what we do with this 3D photogrammetry is we take photographs 
all around from different angles and perspectives and then we can now run that through some softwares that have been developed all those photographs dozens and dozens of photos and the the software will join them together as a 3d model and so now we can uh, 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 render these objects in 3d and and it's a beautiful beautiful way of sharing what a site looks like uh, with people and you know this stuff can now even be 3d printed so we can take a shipwreck 3d model it print it and have it you know there on the desk or the museum so uh, this is definitely a, a, a nice wonderful exciting way to document sites that you know again I'm talking about drawing and mapping and this just really brings things to life in a new way what it does as well is I think it speeds up the uh, the process. So if one is pressed for time and one yes. cannot employ Absolutely. the traditional methods of mapping. Absolutely. Or if you're working in yep. deep waters yeah. and, and, and you cannot spend uh, yeah. a long time, then these new techniques okay. actually Do make, it all through uh, photographs. Exactly. So yeah, this is exciting stuff. And I think a lot of it is, you know, we have yet to learn the potential of it all. You know, it is, it's, it is uh, that new. and, and you know, it's really only in the last year or two that people have started messing with this. So lots to come. It's exciting time. That is exciting. <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. Um, and, and we kind of talked a little bit earlier about the importance of the technology with, with underwater archaeology. And it is a growing business. It, the, just the technology itself is advancing Absolutely. so much from where we used to be. Um, but let's go back to some of the stuff that you talked about with the Santa Maria and the Atocha. You said that the museum has got all kinds of artifacts, mm -hmm. and I think we've got a couple of pictures of those. So if you want, can you walk us through some of what? Oh, sure, have? absolutely. Yeah, um, our museum is f uh, uh, focused on a variety of shipwrecks. Of course, our, our, our Atocha and Margarita, the 1622 galleons, form the core of our collection, um, and we have a wide array of things from those. Now, of course, on a shipwreck, you know, and, and, and Timmy will talk about, uh, you know, what they have found in, in the Mediterranean. But, you know, around here we find everything. You know, you don't find just silver coins or just a ship's hull. You find the, 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 the ship's cargo. You find the things that people uh, were using. You know, their dishes, their medical the pieces of their clothing. You find, uh, uh, um, you know, the tools that they were using as well as the ship's hull. And, and so, uh, it's a really wide array of material and a really brilliant, brilliant insight into what life was like for people at whatever time this particular ship was sailing. Uh, and so when you, know, you come into our museum, you're going to see all of that. We don't present just one aspect of something. We try to present everything. And, so, uh, uh, and we do it you know, largely through these artifacts. So it's a, a, a wide, wide array of, of material from a variety of shipwrecks. We are working on many, many different underwater projects right now. So, Timmy, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what some of the projects that you've been involved in? Because I know you, you do a lot of the plane stuff, too. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Classics and Archaeology right. at the University of Malta, where we do a lot of the traditional terrestrial archaeology, but for the past 12 years, we've also had a focus on uh, maritime and underwater archaeology. Part of uh, our program, besides the educational trust, is, the, uh, is a research program that we've been uh, running for a number of years, together with uh, various partners, both in Malta and, and overseas. A recent project that we uh, that we've undertaken is the uh, research of planes, plane crash sites underwater, what is today referred to as aviation archaeology underwater. And Malta has a long history, of, it has a long aviation history. It was a British colony, so planes arrived uh, quite early. Uh, in the 1920s, there was already a seaplane base. And up until the closure of the NATO base, there was a concentration of military planes. The, the, the peak of aircraft crash sites on the water dates to the Second World War, where we have planes from the American, British, German and Italian, uh, Italian air forces. So what we're doing now is we're uh, starting to, uh, to focus some research 
on the recording and mapping of these planes and also uh, to better understand how they how they're preserved underwater and what we can learn from uh, from studying such such sites um, so when you get to these sites and especially with the plane sites is it any different than a shipwreck site are there any special challenges are they usually going to be deeper? Are they shallower? Or are they about the same? Because I know that the, the shipwreck sites can vary greatly with, with depth and range. Um, but anything special about plane wrecks? Well, plane wrecks, at least in the central Mediterranean, um, can differ. Because you can have planes which were coming back from the North African campaign and uh, sinking somewhere between North Africa and Sicily which can be 800 or, or, or 1,000 feet deep or, or, or more. And you can have uh, plane, plane wrecks in 90 or 100 feet of water. Each site is, uh, is different, um, if, whether we're talking about shipwrecks or and, or and or airplanes. Also, their state of preservation is different, um, depending on whether it's been looted, depending on whether, depending on whether uh, the natural processes have, have uh, taken hold of, of the plane. What is uh, specific about planes is that if we can get the identity of the plane, usually they have a, an identification tag, we can work backwards and actually trace back the history of the pilot himself, or the pilot and his crew. So uh, that has a real human story because more often than not, family members of that particular pilot are still alive today, whether the pilot has survived or not. In one particular case, we have a story of the pilot getting out of one of the planes, uh, one of the planes that we studied, and only to be shot down three months later, because we were mm. able to trace his career wow. further down the water. So uh, that was quite, uh, quite a poignant uh, find. Yeah. Um, so when you guys find shipwrecks, or when you find the plane I know there's a lot of laws involved. Um, there's a lot of red tape that you have to get through. Can you describe a little bit of, of some of the stuff that you guys have had to go through to, once you find the shipwrecks? How do you how do you excavate it? How do you um, preserve it and, and still be able to get what you want out of the shipwreck? Um, I know we talked about some of the, the sites have been completely encrusted in coral in, in your case and, and yours they have lots of seagrasses that are on it. So, let's, yeah. Corey, let's start with you. And we'll yeah, it, it, here in, in, you know, from my experience, um, and it's, I'll, I'll speak about today, because, you know, these laws have changed over the past few decades. Um, within the Florida Keys, um, you know, this is all National Marine Sanctuary, so you, you do fall under the umbrella of the National Marine Sanctuary. So we have to work with them. You know, we, we uh, uh, present an idea to them and uh, apply for permission to, to conduct that research and you know they review the application and then you know, give the permit. Um, that's also done um, with the, uh, the state of Florida. They have purview as well in, in this area. Um, so yeah there is some red tape definitely. Um, we have, uh, even with that, been able to do a, a, a heck of a lot of research um, and, and really good stuff. So I don't feel that it's really impeded us all that much. Um, we do uh, have other things that come into play in what you alluded to, um, natural resources. You know, I'm talking about uh, earlier about the uh, Guerrero site or what we think is the Guerrero site. Wonderful shipwreck. You know, it's a, a debris field of material covered in coral. <laughs> and so there are lots of uh, uh, endangered corals, threatened corals, sea grasses that are all there. Um, it's very unlikely that uh, this site will ever be excavated because to, if we were to really truly excavate that we'd have to disrupt all of these these natural resources. So um, I you know sometimes nature trumps history in these cases and I think this is one of them. Uh, um, so that's definitely a factor. Uh, I've worked in the Bahamas a lot as well, so we have to work with the Bahamian government, and they have different rules. And, and so, but you always, you know, you adapt and you follow whatever the law is in the particular area, and it all works out. And Timmy, you said that um, earlier we were talking, and you were talking about the Mediterranean being a dead sea. Um, and then you get some of these shipwrecks that kind of become an artificial reef. And so kind of the same thing, they've got lots of life on them, 
compared to other places, and you've also got all the seagrass that you have to contend with. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, there are actually two different things. There's the seagrass in the Mediterranean grows to a maximum depth of around 50 meters, uh, which is 150 feet. So uh, shipwrecks or, and or planes which are on the seabed from 150 feet and shallower have one particular context, so one, one, one kind of habitat which, uh, which surrounds them. And then deeper shipwrecks have one or even more types of habitats which, uh, in which they are situated. In the case of the shallower shipwrecks, the seagrass grows on top of the, uh, in, uh, the ancient shipwrecks and the uh, seagrass is a highly protected species because it is extremely important for for the biodiversity of uh, of the mediterranean sea and as Corey just said and put it so eloquently this is a case where nature trumps history and we can only explore little bits of uh, bits and pieces of the shipwreck uh, which are uh, situated in voids within within the uh, the seagrass. For the deeper shipwrecks, the, the, the seabed is indeed like a desert, um, especially these vast areas which are devoid of any rocky outcrops or, okay. or underwater reefs. So these, uh, the ancient shipwrecks, especially if it's a concentration of ancient amphoras, ancient uh, ceramic containers, acts as a sediment trap and then the, the, the plankton is attracted to, to the sediments and so on until these uh, are bursting with, uh, with sea life. And not only does it make it extremely beautiful, not only does it make the site extremely beautiful, but it makes it uh, extremely important from a biodiversity point of, uh, point of view. Right. So we've got a couple questions that are actually coming in. Um, we got one from Ramona Crawford. It says, either, uh, are either of today's guests involved with the search for Amelia Earnhardt? Um, so that's, we kind of mentioned that earlier, the, they think that they found the Amelia Earnhardt plane or a piece of it. Um, you guys are not involved with that either, are you? No, we're, we're uh, not, although we've mapped the numerous planes. And, and I can understand why the search for Amelia Earnhardt's plane captures the imagination, but there are, believe you me, thousands of other aeroplane crash sites that are equally as important and have an equally important story to tell. Uh, you know, uh, th this whole aspect and, and what, what Timmy's doing is, is fascinating. I mean, who would think that the ocean is this repository of aircraft? <laughs> yeah. It's sort of counterintuitive. Yeah, you, you, know? think, you think shipwrecks, you don't necessarily <laughs> think right. airplanes. And, and I mean, what a fascinating aspect of marine archaeology that you just would never think of, you know? Right. Uh, and the, the thing about aviation archaeology is that we, in just a span of a hundred years, we've gone from the Wright brothers to the space shuttle. Yeah. And Phenomenal. everything is represented on the seabed right. because most of right. the, uh, let's call them artifacts, most of the older planes were either cannibalized or scrapped. So we really have a, an important window on aviation technology uh, present on, uh, on, on the seabed. So yes, Amelia Earhart's story is a fundamental part or chapter of that story, but there are many, many other chapters uh, yet yet to be discovered. And we we kind of mentioned this, and, and this goes along with the Amelia Earhart story. Um, you think of treasure as treasure as in gold and silver and stuff that's worth a lot of, of money, but I think you get a lot more out of the treasure, too. Um, describe what you guys get out of finding a shipwreck or finding a plane that you've really searched for i mean i know it's that's a loaded question yeah. <laughs> um but can you give me a little bit of of what it is to you that you get out of finding this stuff well there is a uh, a small excavation well, there was a small excavation that uh, some students of mine and i conducted in 2002 and we brought up a uh, a number of artifacts from uh, from the seabed, including uh, stuff which was just day-to-day -day stuff. So pieces of bowls, lamps, uh, plates that they ate from, and this was this gave us uh, fantastic insight into the day-to-day -day lives of uh, of these seafarers. They uh, had no 
idea of, of putting things in a bag and putting them ashore. So they would eat, they would cook, they would break plates and throw everything, they would throw everything into the sea. One of the artifacts that we did find was uh, where we, uh, numerous dice on the seabed. And uh, we were thinking, you know, what kind of game could would be played whereby these dice are, are, are being thrown into the sea? We found one, two, in a, one, in a week excavation, we, we found about 36 of these dice. Four were made out of stone and 32 were made out of bone. And in the end, we did some research in, uh, in the archives and we, we found out that in the uh, 1500s and 1600s, gambling was <laughs> completely illegal on board. And if you got caught gambling, you'd be severely punished. So what these uh, sailors were doing as they were cooking their meal in the same bowls and same plates and eating them from the same place that we eventually found in the seabed, getting their knife out and carving the bones and making these dice out of, uh, out of these bones, yeah. gambling and you know, winning each <laughs> other's pay, and then obviously not to get caught, throwing them into the sea. And <laughs> this is something that would certainly not go down in the, into the history books because right. it was something that the, the seafarers wanted to hide. Yeah. And this is, if you want, the treasure that archaeology actually gives to us on a day-to-day day -day basis. I, I mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know, it's. Uh, uh, I always say to people, you know, it, it's an old analogy, but a, a shipwreck is a time capsule, you know, and you have uh, a little community out on the water, and they're doing some purpose, whether it's fishing or whether it's transporting a cargo across the ocean, and they have everything they need to do that and to keep themselves happy and healthy and moving forward through their lives. That's suddenly dashed to the sea floor in a day when you have a shipwreck. And that is a moment frozen in time. And you have not the things that people were trying to get rid of or throw away or their garbage. That's there too. But you have all the things they wanted and needed. And I think in some ways when we're talking about a shipwreck that uh, we have a, a, a a more pure insight into what people were using and their values and, the, and, and their times. And so um, it's an incredibly rich look at really moments in time. And, and uh, I just, you know, for me, uh, uh, marine archaeology and, and shipwreck archaeology like that, it's unparalleled as to what you can see and learn from. And treasures even, you know. Uh, you, you, silver coins or silver bars or gold bars wonderful things you know and yes they're worth money and they're shiny and they're pretty but they have a wonderful story behind them too you know there's this whole economic engine that they represent and and you know even things like that you can you can look at them in in different ways and 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 learn from them in ways that you might not immediately think of um so what are some of the I guess the process steps of once you find an artifact, you can't just bring it straight up and let it sit out in the air. You, it has to go through a very long, strenuous process. Uh, can either one the, of you? The power of the sea is uh, such that it starts to uh, affect the, the artifact. But there is a, a point in time where that artifact, uh, where an artifact can actually stabilize under under water, but uh, the moment that artifact is brought up and brought out of that so-called stable environment, then the whole process starts to change. And there is a whole science. This is these are not archaeologists that undertake this work. These are uh, conservators, people who have studied science but have a love for for historic objects. And uh, for example, there's, there was this fantastic bronze statue brought up from the Mediterranean. You can see this uh, picture of, of the statue as it was brought out. And after many, many years of conservation, you can actually see what was lying underneath all those encrustations. And this is a process which takes a lot of time, a lot of expertise, and costs a lot of money. So the moment that people bring up artifacts without this knowledge, then there is a, uh, a big risk to these very important historic objects. Yeah, the, 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 the conservation 
of these marine materials um, is something that I think people underestimate. They don't understand it, perhaps. Um, but yeah, the, these objects have they fall into the sea floor. They sit there for centuries. They're changed. They're changed physically. They look much different, but they're changed chemically. And to reverse all of that and get something back into the shape that it was originally is a huge process. And uh, you know, for every you know, I tell people for every month we're underwater, we probably generate two years worth of laboratory work. You know, uh, um, it, it, it's just that is what makes or break a project. We don't dive down, find something cool, and we're done. Um, we have to spend a huge amount of time and money and effort to uh, uh, stabilize these things so th they can't even be in the air anymore. You know, you, the, the oxygen will attack them. And so we have to, to stabilize them and get them so they're in a, a condition that we can put them back into the you know, museum showcase and give them another you know, five or six or you know, millennia of, of life again. And it's, it's not an easy task. So we're seeing a couple little videos here on the screen. Yeah, these are um, some. Can you kind of tell us what's going on? Yeah, these are some shots in the laboratory, and and uh, um, this is a, a an arquebus barrel and a very early type of musket barrel um, from one of the galleons, and it is uh, having the salt extracted from the metal basically, and the conservator there is, is rinsing it at the moment, but it just came out of a, a tank we call a reverse electrolysis, which basically purges salt from, from the metal that's, that's uh, uh, bonded with it over the centuries. And, and once that salt's liberated from it and the uh, corrosion compounds are stabilized, then you know, we can uh, uh, get the piece dried out, coated, and, and presentable again. Um, it's going to take a long time. A piece like that, that, that you see one simple object, that's probably about a year's worth of conservation work that has to happen with that piece before it can be put into the, the showcase. So not something to be taken lightly. And I always tell people, don't grab stuff off the seafloor, um, you know, because there's this whole backstory that has to happen that you may not think about. And uh, yeah, it's a big part of what we do. So we're getting lots of questions in, um, but let's talk a little bit about when you find these things. We've, we've already discussed that you know it, it takes a lot to get them to where they used to be. But you also don't want looters. So how do you how do you kind of control for looters? Are there are there laws in place um, for that? And then I guess kind of the same thing. Um, are there laws in place for who finds the wreck? Is it theirs or does it belong to like a, the government agency? Or how does all that work? Well, I think every country has its own set of right. laws. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, there is something called the UNESCO Convention for the Protection of Underwater Culture and Heritage, which was uh, implemented in 2001. But not, not all countries have signed it. Yeah. And not all countries that have signed it have actually implemented it. Um, that the UNESCO Convention is a sort of guiding beacon for, for, for countries to set their laws, but every country has its own different uh, regulations with regard to ownership, uh, with regard to management and protection. However, there are some, uh, some laws and regulations which are standard throughout the world. For example, a British warship or a British aeroplane that has been down anywhere in the world actually remains property of the British government. Okay. This is a law uh, which was issued in 1976. And you can start to see the complications of working on su such sites. Because if you're working, for example, on a British plane in Maltese territorial waters, so you've got to watch out for uh, Maltese law. So you're operating under the umbrella of Maltese law, yet the uh, object that you are diving on is still property of the British government and for all intents and purposes the, the pilot may have been Canadian so you are actually potentially disturbing a Canadian war grave and there's a whole set of rules and regulations that uh, that govern uh, com what we call Commonwealth war graves. With regard to the protection uh, I think the 
legacy of secrecy, trying to keep site secret is one that has, that, that its time has passed. Yeah. <laughs> Today, yeah. nearly every boat has a fish finder, with a, even with a simple high-tech fish finder, you can go out and find sites. Everybody's a scuba diver, technical diving down to 300 feet is on the increase. So the focus on protection from looting should be education. Things like what we're doing now, what uh, Corey has just mentioned, so the importance of getting the message out there that you just don't pick up an object. Right. It has to be done in a scientific manner, etc. Right, because you can go out and, and, and find something cool. Say I'm diving yeah. a shipwreck and I find a little coin, and, and to me, it's like, you know, you could just be like, oh, well, hey, that's cool, and, I, and <laughs> stick it in my pocket and take off. And I'm not trying to be mean or, or you know, right. or right, disturb right, right. anything, but that really does cause and a people, lot of problems. And people just don't understand. Right. Yeah, absolutely. As far as, you know, uh, my experience as far as protection and all, uh, nature does a very good job of protecting sites. Um, they are not easy to find. Um, they're not easy to recognize unless you're um, trained. You know, the, um, a lot of the wrecks that we have in the Keys here, they fully blended in with the sea bottom and are covered by growth and that sort of thing. So. It just takes the experienced eye to see that odd little shape and, and recognize it as a shipwreck site. Um, so that's one layer of protection. But as Timmy said, it's you know trying to hide it and not and say never talk about it. I mean that's I don't do that. I mean I go out and I tell people about what we found and and you know explain why it's important and and you know how um, you know. Please try not to mess with these things uh, because, you know, even little tiny pieces can make the big difference in, in understanding a site. You know, um, we have wrecks where a single fragment of broken pottery has changed the game and the understanding of what the wreck is. And so, um, you know, please, if, if, you know, you do find little bits and pieces like that, just leave them where they are. They, uh, you know, right there, you know, and I see on the screen, that, that particular piece of pottery has really allowed us to zero in on dating uh, this particular wreck. We think this might be uh, the key to what we are, are thinking is the Guerrero, you know, which wrecked in 1827. This is a particular type of pottery that's highly datable and was most popular in the 1820s. And so that is really a, the kind of clue we're looking for. And if somebody takes that, then somebody it takes, takes it, we don't have that one single thing that really helps us. Yeah. Right, and it, it could be something like this little piece of pottery that, that doesn't seem like it would be. Seems so, so benign that, yeah. and unimportant, but yet it is. Yeah. The other aspect of uh, educating the general public is it seems that with terrestrial sites, we're already educated. Nobody would dream of going up to the pyramids and breaking off a piece of pyramid to take it <laughs> home. I would laugh about it. But yet, it seems that just because it's under the water, it's fair game. Yeah. And I think the challenge of uh, people involved in the education of the general public, but also uh, curators of museums and lecturers at university, our, our, one of our key aims should be to make sure people, the general public starts to recognize that there is no difference between cultural heritage on land and cultural heritage on the water. Right. They both deserve right. yeah. equal uh, respect. So I guess the finder's keeper rule doesn't work and, and you can't just be like, oh, well, that's mine. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, that's uh, um, certainly within the, the coastal zones. Um, I don't think there is any finder's keeper rule right. anymore. Right. Um, perhaps out in the deeper water, um, you know, that, that still applies to, to some discoveries. Um, but. I know within the U.S. Um, and the Bahamas, anything within the coastal zone is under the purview of either the states, federal government, or the, the, the you know whatever country government. So yeah, don't just grab stuff; you can get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> for for deeper waters, we use uh, technologies to to actually because that we're coming to another frontier, which is which are the waters that are deeper than, than the standard scuba depth of mm -hmm. 150 feet. We use technologies such as uh, side scan sonar. The traditional way is to tow it behind the ship, but there are other, other ways of deploying that, uh, that uh, sonar. And uh, one, of the, one of these new technologies is through an AUV. Uh, it's now been made famous through the search for the, uh, for the crash uh, site of oh, yeah. uh, of Australia, 
and um, through the use, through, through the deployment of these technologies, we're able to discover sites in, uh, in deeper waters. And the site scan sonar creates images, so photos made by sound rather than photos made by light, of, uh, in this case, here on the screen, we're seeing a, an ancient shipwreck, which Rory quite rightly said, you, you have to have some a trained eye because it may seem like a pile of rocks to the untrained yeah, eye. Yeah, I, uh, I would pass that over in a <laughs> yeah. heartbeat. I'd say, oh, well, I don't so know what that is. So. It's a pile of rocks, but th that is actually a shipwreck which is 1,900 years old. It dates from the Roman period. That's a huge pile of uh, ceramic containers, uh, which we call amphoras, which were used to, to carry oil and, uh, and olive oil. But um, you can see now other recognizable uh, objects on the seabed on the left th that's the remnants of a, uh, a ju-88 or a plane that was used by the german air force in world war ii and on the right that's a sonar image of a of a submarine um, these sites in deeper waters are extremely well preserved um, and by going out there and mapping through sonar and other technologies we're, uh, we're able to, uh, to know where the, to locate these sites because the first thing that you need to know to manage is you need to know where they are because if you don't know where they are then you can't take informed decisions such as no trawl fishing, no anchoring etc etc. So we're now reaching a time for, of new, what I call the new frontier, so, so deeper waters whether they're coastal or whether they're in international waters, these deeper waters, we've seen through experience that there are numerous well-preserved sites, both in the Mediterranean and, and, and beyond. And these deserve equal, uh, uh, they deserve protection. And we're at an advantage because now the archaeologists do have the technology to go out there. So we don't depend on a diver or a sponge diver telling us where the sites are and getting to them slightly late. We're trying to take a, m a more proactive uh, stance of going there, finding them ourselves, and taking informed decisions for their protection. So you're talking about deeper, deeper wrecks. What are some of the challenges that you face with deeper wrecks as opposed to some of the shallower wrecks? Well, there are there are a number of challenges. One is the availability of technology. It is available, rather, but it is still rather expensive yeah money <laughs> yeah, for archaeologists to, to get their hands on funding to use certain technologies uh, technologies like uh, ROVs remote uh, operated vehicles uh, which can vary in size from half as the size of a small car to these mega ROVs which are used in, in, in the oil industry um, so the challenge is actually getting down to the site. Some uh, archaeologists do technical diving and they do dive down to sites at, 95, at, uh, at 300 feet or 350 feet. But then there are related challenges to diving at those depths too, which are limited times, uh, pressure on the body um, and so on. So it's money, money equaling uh, access to technology and also the limited time of uh, for technical dives. So this kind of brings it into a good point that we've talked to our students about. Um, when we talk about habitats, we talk about that could be a very useful tool for archaeologists for some of those deeper dives. You could take a habitat, sit it down close to where you think the site is. Once you become saturated at that depth, you can hang out there and your bottom time goes from, you know, 18 minutes if you were just a normal diver diving down so you could stay hours or days down there and yeah. really get to see some of the sites and some of the life that lives on these reefs, or on these wrecks, sorry. <laughs> it, it, um, the pathway of habitats is something that has unfortunately been overlooked by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. I think since the advent of underwater archaeology five decades ago, th there's been so much excitement about finding different sites. I mean, exploring different sites just it may be time now to to take a step back and start revisiting you know different techniques that can be used now especially that we're looking at deeper sites perhaps the 
conversation should be revived as to whether habitats you know fit into uh, the line of work of, 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 of working on deeper sites wonderful tool you know again it probably comes to money and, yeah. and you know, yes most archaeologists don't have that much <laughs> but if it was a, if it was some kind of of organization privately oh, or yeah. government organization that would definitely be to, able to to, to have what we're in right now and you know park near a rec site and to be living and and you know sw swimming out in the moon pool to that would just be brilliant that would be wonderful absolutely yeah, yeah. so yeah and and one thing that um we you kind of overlook especially um people who don't dive much but when you dive down to some of these deep sites uh, like the when you found the amphora that were fairly deep um, you guys had a bottom time of what about 18 minutes something like that and then you had to decompress the whole way up and you spent a lot of time in the water column um, can you tell us a little bit about what the divers went through yeah that? it's um, for a wreck at approximately 315 feet there's 18 minutes bottom time and Four and a half hours coming up uh, slowly to uh, to the surface. So you spend all that time getting down. You can only <laughs> sit on there for 18 minutes, and then you have to spend four hours in the water. Four hours plus. Four hours plus coming coming up. So that is a challenge because for 18 minutes on the seabed, so just keep in mind the hour or two that it takes to prepare the gear maybe an hour to get out to the site you've got 18 minutes dive and you've got five minutes uh, uh, sorry five hours coming up between four and a half hours and five hours coming up by the time you make it back to the dock and you rinse your gear that is an entire uh, eight hour working day not only for the two divers that went down let's assume that two divers went down but for the backup team that have been with you because you have divers that come and give you support at 50 meters for the boatman, for the people who are on, 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 on the boat, like the, the uh, hyperbaric nurse, etc. So you have a team of 10, 10 times 8 man hours, 80 hours, for a combined 36 minutes on the seabed. That's a lot of effort for 36 minutes. And this is where uh, the potential of the possibility of working through habitats or using ROVs even even manned submersibles comes in to at least increase your bottom time on, on deep, deep water sites. Right, well, and when we talked about uh, the Titanic, a little bit about the Titanic earlier, and the Titanic is obviously too deep for divers, and so they use the submersibles. Um, and with these submersibles, you, you're still, you've, you've increased your bottom time, but you're still looking at a ton of money, and you're, and you're yeah. looking at um, limited access because of the size of the submersible and the technology on the submersible itself. Um, so we're getting a couple more questions. So let's see. Um, if a country loses a war and there's a completely different government, does the modern government still own the artifacts? Um, for example, like Nazi Germany. So that is a very, uh, there's no straight answer. Exactly. I think there's no straight answer. There's a very gray, gray uh, area on this. Um, so a German plane on the seabed could be considered as a prize for the winning, for, for, the, for the victor. Right. But who is the victor? Is it, is it Britain in this case because they were fighting in the, in the Mediterranean basin? Or is it, uh, are they the allies? So is, is the ownership divided between France, Britain and America? And if so, you know, what, what percentage? of the wreck is owned by which country so it's a, an extremely oh, wow. gray area yeah. and uh, it's it's like negotiating a minefield so there isn't just the complexity of getting down there finding it working on it protecting it but there's there's also the legal quagmire that one has to uh, has to avoid yeah who are the stakeholders and the, the similar thing has happened with uh, uh, you know some of the spanish colonial wrecks you know is it Spain's or is it the you know what was the former colonies and and you know it's not fully settled in, in a lot of these cases so I can see where that definitely gets yeah. to be a, a problem yeah. um, so we've got another question what what's the oldest work site that you guys have worked well this summer um, we worked on a site uh, 
which we found a few years ago, but we returned to it with a submersible this, uh, this summer, and we uh, recorded this, the amphoras um, in, in, in a lot of detail. We had a vessel over for four days. We took approximately eight thousand photographs of the site to uh, to create a 3D uh, uh, image of the site. Um, well, I'll give you the straight answer. The oldest site of where is, is a Phoenician shipwreck, which uh, we're uh, we're about to see on the on the screen. And this dates to 700 BC. It's the oldest wow. shipwreck in the Central Mediterranean. Wow! It's 2,700 years old. Uh, it's Beautiful. no longer than 50 feet long and uh, we can uh, zoom in and have a look at its cargo it was carrying mixed uh, ceramic containers about seven different kinds of ceramic containers one of them uh, one of the seven types we've never seen before so just imagine that this was destroyed by a fisherman or a technical diver went down to 105 meters and just happened to pick that one up we would not have right. this essential uh, piece piece of the puzzle so yeah. this is a shipwreck from what we call the archaic period of mediterranean uh, history quite unique for mm -hmm. the central mediterranean and uh, i'm sure that over the following next years is going to give us a lot and a lot of uh, joy when we explore and study it now, do you know what some of these containers um, were carrying? Because I know the amphoras, you, they think, um, were carrying wine, correct? Wine and or olive oil. But this particular shipwreck was also carrying uh, grinding stones uh, made of volcanic rock, probably from, uh, from Sicily. But it was also carrying urns. Urns are these, these ceramic uh, containers with a flat bottom. Mm -hmm. And we only know of them, or we mainly know of them, from the context of burials. So uh, this may be the first instance of these urns being exported, or and or somebody, you know, knowing that the Phoenicians buried their dead in one way in one part of the Mediterranean, and wishing to replicate, and hence transporting these urns uh, for use elsewhere. We have a very interesting scenario here in the Florida Keys where we have relatively shallow waters. Um, uh, first of all, I'll say the oldest shipwreck itself that I've worked on is 450 years old. You know, we, our historic period only goes back 500 years in this area. Um, so we don't have these, you know, 2,000 year plus uh, old vessels. But uh, uh, we do have a very interesting phenomenon here. Um, we know that since the last ice age the seas have come up tremendously and what's happened is um, sites prehistoric sites are now inundated and we find them underwater and uh, we uh, a few years ago uh, had the good fortune of coming across a site 35 miles west of key west in 50 feet of water um, and we were uh, uh, digging looking for a, a remains of a particular shipwreck dug down into the seafloor and we hit this whole layer of organic material, tree stumps and branches and, uh, you know, pine cones and all of this. You know, at first we thought it was part of the wreck and then we realized, gosh, this just doesn't make sense. So we sampled some of the, uh, the wood and sent it off for analysis. It came back, it was 8,500 years old. And what we had wow. discovered, what was the prehistoric shoreline of Florida, Oh, wow. Now 50 feet underwater, you know, way out to sea. Um, and there are sites like that all over this area. Uh, we're looking right now, we're working with the Marine Sanctuary here to try to pinpoint a site that's been reported to us that sounds like it may be a human occupation site um, in about 25 feet of water. Um, so, uh, you know, it's probably four or five, six thousand years old. Uh, and by human but, occupation, you're talking about like a city. That, that's well, not a city water. per se, but a human-made structure okay. that is now buried uh, in, the, in the waters off the Florida Keys. So it's a whole new and wonderful aspect of marine archaeology in this particular area that I think is, you're going to see and hear more about. It's in fact that this uh, new aspect of marine archaeology, which is often referred to as submerged prehistory, yeah. is something that is exploding throughout the world, yeah. in, 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 in the North Sea of England, also yeah. throughout the Mediterranean and also in the, uh, in the US. So this is, uh, watch this space.
yeah. submerged prehistory is uh, the next big thing with, with regard to underwater archaeology. You know what was really amazing about uh, this, this prehistoric site we found was the preservation. It was stunning. We have pieces of pine that still smelled like pine. I mean, you couldn't imagine it because they had been buried and covered over in this silty muck and had stayed preserved in that. It was almost like, if you can imagine, a, a dense jello made of silt. Uh, um, and this stuff was in that and it just as if it had been flash frozen 8,500 years ago. Phenomenal. Hard to believe. So the, the beauty of underwater archaeology is that you can have something as recent as a plane that crashed 60 years ago yeah. to a human settlement which is now underwater dating to 20,000 years ago or 15,000 years yeah. ago and I think even the state of preservation the, the uh, the, the variety of sites, and that is one of the few things that makes uh, underwater archaeology unique. All right, guys, well, we've only got a couple more minutes, so I'm going to finish up with one more question. <laughs> this, is, this is my personal favorite question. Um, what's the neatest thing or the coolest thing that you guys have actually discovered? What's the most interesting thing? I know, it's a loaded question. I'll tell Again, you, I've got no, all kinds I, of loaded I, questions. I, I, get, I get this question all the time. I have a very simple answer. Um, it kind of relates to what I just talked about, but um, people always expect me to say gold bars and all that, and I have found that sort of stuff. But uh, uh, insects. On two different shipwrecks, uh, I have been able to find insects from centuries ago. And, I, you know, if we are to the point in our excavation that we're finding uh, fragments of beetles, we're doing a good job <laughs> and I feel good about it and and to have done that twice on two different shipwrecks just brings me a real satisfaction to know that we're finding everything possible out there and it's stunning to know that that sort of thing can be preserved after all that time but it can and you have to keep an eye open you never know what you're gonna find when you're working on one of these sites and you always have to keep an open mind and an open eye how about you? I'm sorry to disappoint you. I have a very similar answer, <laughs> be it the dice that we found. I'm just yeah. imagining the same as hunched up under the deck, gambling and trying not to be caught to the plane of the pilot that got away to, you know, the warship that got sunk, running a convoy to, to Malta, trying to save the island, uh, you know, from, uh, from, from, from sea. So every site has something special and yeah. every time that uh, I discover a site and return to it to study brings back that, that, that special feeling. So I think it's safe to say that it's not just the treasure as in the, the gold and the silver that you guys find but it's definitely the, the history and the context of, of the stuff that was surrounding the shipwreck. So that's, that's what's worthwhile yeah. for you guys. And you know, in the big picture, uh, you know, this stuff all reflects back on ourselves. These things are the building blocks that brought us to where we are today. And you know, and it really comes down to, if we want to understand ourselves, we need to look at these things and understand where we came from. And it's all part of us. Well guys, I really want to thank you both for taking time to come down here and talk to us. We really appreciate it. I'm sure our viewers really appreciate it. Um, so stay tuned for next week's episode. Uh, we're going to have the ocean exploration and climate change.
Classroom Under the Sea is made possible through the generous support of Diversity in Aquatics, the project's official sponsor. To learn more, please visit diversityinaquatics.com. Additional support for this episode comes from Jules Undersea Lodge. With more information online at jul.com. Classroom Under the Sea is presented by the Marine Resources Development Foundation on Key Largo in the Florida Keys and Roan State Community College, one of Tennessee's community colleges.